My guest was a leader at the great Brownsville Revival. Very few true believers in this generation have seen what he saw with his very own eyes. Why is this so important? At this time, it's about to be released again, except 1,000 times stronger. Welcome, welcome, Holy Spirit. Thank you for being our most gracious, important guest. Dr. Michael Brown is Jewish, has a doctorate from New York University. He speaks, reads, and writes over half a dozen Semitic languages and is considered one of the top Hebrew biblical scholars in the world. He has authored 10 books on revival and experienced three revivals personally. Now, he says, God has shown him the next move of God's Spirit. I want Mike to tell us how a Jewish New York Supreme Court judge's son became radical for Jesus. And then, to top it off, he becomes a renowned Semitic scholar concentrating on proving Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. Mike, how did this all happen briefly? I've seen pictures with you having not gray hair, not the short hair, but you had it full blazes. Oh, yeah. When my wife Nancy saw an old picture of me, because she didn't know me in the hippie days, she started laughing. I said, you're laughing because I look like a woman. She said, no, I'm laughing because you look like an ugly woman. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> so here's the deal. I was raised in a, a nominal Jewish home, so I was bar mitzvah at 13 and so on. But we weren't religious Jews. We didn't go to synagogue every Sabbath or keep the dietary laws. But I knew I'm, I'm Jewish. I don't believe in Jesus. I got caught up in the counterculture movement, started getting high at 14, shooting heroin at 15. My two best friends started going to a church. They got born again. I went to pull them out. The people started praying for me. The Holy Spirit convicted me of sin. And then the end of 1971, I met the Lord. I was instantly transformed. I said, I will never put a needle in my arm again. December 17, 71, free from that moment on by the power of God. And uh, some days later, my dad said, Michael, I'm glad you're off drugs, but we're Jews. We don't believe this. You need to talk to the rabbi. So I become friends with the local rabbi. I want to share Jesus with everybody, right? Of course. And we begin talking back and forth. And he says, how can you tell us what to believe? You don't know Hebrew. I said, well, I'm using this dictionary. He goes, hey, he said, in the meantime, Shemin Tommy said, you need to know Hebrew. You can't teach us anything. So I was provoked. I knew Jesus had changed my life. I knew it was real. But how can I talk to these rabbis and these learned ones that said the New Testament mistranslated the old and I didn't know what I was talking about and you couldn't rely on the English translation. So I majored in Hebrew in college and then I got a master's and a PhD at New York University in Near Eastern Languages and Literatures because I said I need to be able to read it and study it for myself. I can't rely on another commentary, another dictionary. And, and everyone I studied with all through my school, no one believed what I believed. I never studied with someone who believed the things I believed. So I was challenged every single day for years. I met with rabbi after rabbi, ultra-Orthodox rabbis. And the more I studied, the clearer it became. The more I dug, the more I found, whoa, this is amazing. The, the, the deeper you dig, the clearer it becomes Jesus, Yeshua is the Messiah. I said, I believe I've had the privilege of debating more rabbis, public debates about Jesus being the Messiah than any human being on the planet today. There's only one problem. What? I can't get anyone to debate me. Dr. Michael Brown will explain why we should know about past revivals and God's outpouring of his glory. Why? His strong warning about putting God in a box and his experience with three revivals and his eyewitness report of major miracles. So, so Sid, when we go back and read the Word, we find out who God is and we find out what He does, the kind of God He is, and that builds our faith. Why not now? Why not here? So I would read about the past revivals. 
I hear about the glory coming out of the Welsh revival in 1904, 1905, the Hebrides revival in 1949 to 1952. And you hear about God sovereignly saving. You hear about crime rates dropping. You hear about judges wearing white gloves because they had no more cases to try. You hear about men in the bars going to have a drink and they couldn't because they were under conviction because their wives were praying and they, they fall on the street and get saved and cry out. And you say, Lord, where is it? Why not today? It's not a matter of being nostalgic. You say, why not again? The Jesus People Movement, when so many of us got saved, late 60s, early 70s, uh, among the highest number getting saved, worse Jews, hippies, radicals, rebels, all over the world, sovereignly saved. You say, Lord, we need to have that again. We need to see it again. I am an eyewitness. I prayed, I fasted, I groaned, I cried for years. God showed me in the spring of 1983. I was virtually unknown just doing my PhD work. God had radicalized my own life with a fresh outpouring of the Spirit because Sid, along the way to my doctorate, I was getting intellectually, theologically proud. I was embarrassed of my charismatic Pentecostal roots. God rocked my world, brought me to repentance, sent the fire, brought me back to my first love. The fire fell in our church. The church ended up rejecting what God was doing after months of outpouring. And God spoke to me, you'll be in a revival that will touch the whole world. First, I thought, you, you, I'm crazy. It's, it's not the case. The more I prayed, the more, the more I agonized, the more he made it clear. Thirteen years I held to that, cried out, and then Brown's Revival, God brought me right in the thick of that. And I, I can tell you what I, what I saw with my own eyes. I can tell you stories of people that I, that I knew, knew the people. You know, one, one night, these two Playboy bunnies, they're in Pensacola, Florida. There's going to be a photo shoot. They're on the beaches. Hurricane-like weather cancels it, so they got a free night. They hire a taxi. Where's the action in Pensacola? Playboy bunnies? Playboy bunnies. The driver says, the church here in Pensacola. He drives them to the church. That's where the action is at the end of the service <laughs> they're there weeping and shaking in repentance John Kilpatrick the pastor goes over to see what's going on with these ladies one of them says we feel like God shook the hell out of us one of my friends got to know one of the ladies well I mean they came under conviction they read the word they said we can't do what we're doing anymore one of them got to know him well for years a, a guy comes into the church the son of an assembly of God pastor he is openly homosexual he's in relationship with a gay man he's angry with God he's angry with Brownsville because of what God's doing there, but obviously something's happening in the man's heart. He walks into the building. The power of God hits him in the vestibule of the building. He's laid out there. The ushers carry him and lay him in the front of the building at the altar where he stays the whole night, gets radically born again and changed. A friend of mine has known him for years, a transformed man by the power of God. This is the kind of stuff that happened. You mean just laying under the power of God, a lifestyle of homosexuality, sexual activity was just lifted from him? The Spirit of God, the piercing Word of God, the call for repentance, the man opens his heart and is radically transformed. I'm preaching in a church in New Jersey some years ago. The Spirit's moving powerfully. The pastor says, you need to hear our story. He said, five of us pastors went down to Pensacola. We were in the services. We enjoyed the meetings. We were blessed. But we left disappointed. We were expecting more. We get on the plane to fly back Sunday afternoon. We're going to be at our Sunday night service at the church. We bought five tickets together. Somehow they're all separated. We get on the plane. It's a short flight to Atlanta and we transfer planes. He said, as I sit down and the plane's about to take off, the spirit falls on me and I begin weeping on the plane. He can't wait to get off to tell the others only to find out it happened to all five simultaneously, <laughs> separately on the plane. It was God's way of saying, it's not the crowds. It's not the hype. It's my spirit. He goes from there. The spirit falls in their church. Two years later, they were still in an outpouring. I mean, I heard this day and night. The most dramatic story I was involved with in the middle of nowhere in Canada. Why we even ended up there, who knows? There were some First Nation people, some native Canadians there. They had come very discouraged. They were on a reserve, a reservation with 1,200 people. 
a little church had gone through a split. Now they had two little churches. <laughs> they were among a thousand people that heard the message that night. I laid hands on every one of them, but something happened in them. One year later, I had this confirmed by three independent eyewitnesses. One year later, they had been going with meetings night after night after night because the spirit fell. One year later, 1,150 out of the 1,200 people on the reserve had come to Jesus. That's God. That only happens when the spirit works. And, and that's why we say, do it again, God. If you could do that, if, if in a few months, the, the work of, of years and decades could, could take place, we launched a missions movement that raised up a ministry school. Some of our missionaries have been on the, on the road now for 25 years overseas, and they're seeing God change lives. That's the lasting fruit of revival. We must have it again today. The situation in America, in the world, is more urgent than it ever is. God's going to move with greater urgency than ever. And, and very briefly, what do you mean when you say, don't put God in a box? When God moves, when he shakes us out of the wrong place, it almost always gets us out of our comfort zone. When, when Jesus healed us, why, why did he spit on, on, on dirt and turn it into mud? Why did, he, why did he put spit on a guy's eyes? Why did he do that? Why did, why did he drive he did it deep? today? They say, you're not of God. <laughs> and, and magicians use spittle. Magicians would do it. The, the false gods, would, they said they had the spittle of life among the false gods. Why did he drive demons into the pigs? And the pigs go running down and, and drown in the water. That can't be God. Show me tongues of fire. Where, the moment the spirit falls, there's division. God's not the author of confusion. He doesn't say, prophet A, prophesy there'll be rain. Prophet B, prophesy there'll be no rain. No, but when the spirit comes, he brings up to the surface what's in people's hearts and minds. And almost always, when the fire falls, just like at Pentecost, half of them hear the praises of God, and the other people, they say they're drunk. When the spirit falls, either people shaking under the power of God, like happened with Wesley and Whitfield, or falling, or crying out, or demons leaving, there's something that's going to scandalize us. We, we like a nice little revival. Here, here's our traditional prayer for revival. God, send your power, send your glory, but Lord, leave us in control. Keep, keep it to a convenient little hour. And, and revival is not something you turn on, you turn off. We use discernment, we use wisdom, but we say, God, come and change take us and come and visit whatever the cost or consequence, because there's one thing we can't live without, that's your presence. Now, God showed Mike in 1995 the magnitude of the power of the coming greater glory. It will make Niagara Falls look like a dribble. Be right back. Back to It's Supernatural. Revival or We Die, A Great Awakening is Our Only Hope. This is the most important book I wrote on revival in 25 years. It'll ignite something in you. It'll give you a vision of what revival looks like, what it's like to experience it. We take you into past revivals, from the Brownsville Revival, where I served for four and a half years, from the Hebrides Revival or Welsh Revival or Great Awakenings in the past, and it'll create something in you that says, oh God, oh Lord, do it again. But it's not just a cry for national revival. It's a cry for God to move in our own heart. I open up my own heart, and I talk about times where I left my first love, ask Him to light that fire afresh in me, and talk about how He visited me and revived me. I'm believing with you for a fresh revival, for a fresh spark to start in you. Our hands are stained with blood. The tragic story of the church and the Jewish people. This is the new updated edition this is the single most important book, and this had the most intense impact of any book that I've written. You will learn church history through Jewish eyes. The church history you never knew about, that's not taught from behind the pulpits. It will explain to you why there is such hatred of the Jewish people. It will explain the diabolical nature of anti-Semitism. 
It'll separate fact from fiction when it comes to Israel today. And then we tackle replacement theology, that the church has replaced the Jewish people, that the promises given to Israel now belong to the church, and that God is finished with Israel as a nation. But we will not see a saved Israel without a revived church. And we end with what happens when Israel gets right with God. That means the return of the Messiah and the resurrection of the dead. To experience revival in your home, in your life, and in your community, this is the essential set of two books by Dr. Michael Brown that will ignite the fire you need. Just call or go online at sidroth.org 9980 and make your donation of $35 to get both books, Revival or We Die and the new updated edition of Our Hands Are Stained With Blood. Shipping and handling is included. We now return to It's Supernatural. I told Dr. Brown before we got back on the air, the most important, in my opinion, question I'm going to ask him is right now, why do you say repentance or turning from sin is so important? Repentance is everything, not just in our relationship with God, but especially when we talk about revival. Repentance prepares the way for the visitation of God. Frank Bartleman, used in the Azusa Street Revival, said that the depth of any revival will be determined by the spirit of repentance that is obtained. God comes as a refiner's fire. He brings to the surface all the junk, all the uncleanness, all the things that are wrong. Look, why do we need to be revived? Because we, we've left our first love, because we've compromised with the world, because we've lost the power of God, because we've become religious and proud, because we've allowed sin to come into our lives. Repentance clears the way. Repentance is the first word of the gospel. It's what John the Baptist preaches, what Jesus preaches, what the apostles preach. Paul said, I preach that all men everywhere should repent. And to the churches in Asia Minor, five out of seven, he says, repent or else. If you want God to come in your life, He will pour out a spirit of repentance. He will uncover things, not to condemn us, but to cleanse us. Not to hurt us, but to help us. And I want to say to every single one of you, if you really are hungry and thirsty for God, it will be uncomfortable because He may uncover pride, or wrong motives, or wrong attitudes, or lack of love, or lack of faith, but it's all for the good. Let the refiner's fire do its work. The muck, the junk, is in there anywhere. The Spirit will purge it out so that you can shine for God. And if we want God in our churches, the Holy Spirit will only come where He is welcome and where He feels at home. Therefore, we must deal with sin if we want the glory of God. And, and as I like to say, and you do too, I personally walk in instant repentance. Why? Because I know that if I don't, it will become a stronghold and become much. It's never easier than instantly when the Holy Spirit convicts you. Say, God, I'm sorry. But if you just ignore it, it can grow like a cancer. And sin grows like a cancer. And there are many of you that have never entered into having forgiveness of your sin. Not just forgiveness under the new covenant, God says, I, God, will not only forgive you, but I, God, will remember your sins no more. That is, only God could do that. Say this prayer, mean it to the best of your ability. It's time for you to enter in all the way. Repeat it out loud after I speak. Dear God, please forgive me for every sin I've ever committed. I believe your blood washed me clean. And now that I'm clean because of what you did for me, Jesus, come and live inside of me. Thank you for saving me from my sins. And now I make you Lord over every area of my life. 
Amen. Amen. Mike, you had the most supernatural, amazing encounter at Niagara Falls. So some years ago, early 90s, I'm at Niagara Falls with our older daughter, Jennifer, young girl at that point, young teenager. So we're there together at the falls. We're on the Canadian side of the falls. It's, it's just absolutely stunning. So as we're walking towards the falls, I see just kind of, the, you know, the water running down there. And I thought, that's a picture of normal church life. You know, it's, it's good. But OK, as you get closer, it starts to, you know, the, the rapids and it starts to intensify. And I thought, that's what most people would call revival. That's just the thing starting to get more intense, but that's not revival yet. I just had this sense that Niagara Falls was like a picture of revival. So as we got close, it's just staggering, overwhelming. I said, no, no, no. I want to experience the falls for myself. So I went with Jen. You get these, these jackets, these yellow jackets. I had you say. Okay, and in this case, we, we walk and stand under the falls. So I, the water's pounding and churning, and the wind is blowing. I mean, it's overwhelming. And all I could do is raise my hands and worship. And I thought, that is a picture of revival. I wrote a book that came out three months before Brownsville, three months before the revival. I shared that picture of Niagara Falls. I said, that is a picture of revival. Are you ready? I knew it was about to hit. And Sid, we are in the early stages now of the Holy Spirit beginning to pour out in a fresh way in America, but it's not just going to be a Brownsville or a Toronto. There will be thousands of places where the fire falls, and we must seize the moment when it happens. You know, I, interesting enough, I had a vision about Niagara Falls also. And in this vision, I was there by myself, and the mist that you described started coating me. And it was the light of God. It was the presence of God. It was the glory of God. And it, it, many people don't know this. Almost every day they have a rainbow there. Mm. What does a rainbow stand for? The promises of God, the covenants of God. And so all the promises of God in that glory are going to be instantly unstoppable, amazing answers instantly. It's going to be different than any time you've ever or any generation has ever walked with God. And I'm telling you, I was there alone. You know what that meant? I can't ride on someone else's faith. I've got to ask for myself. I have to hunger and thirst for righteousness. Mike, I want you to turn around and look at this right now. You know, Mike, the, the, I don't know how many years this has been going on, but imagine the unlimited power for this to never stop. It just keeps going on, what we're seeing right now. That's what's coming, the unlimited, unstoppable power of God. Sid, what else is going to get the job done? How else will two billion Muslims turn to Jesus? How else will Israel be saved? How else will America be shaken? There has to be a greater sustained move of God with intensity, with rapidity than we've ever seen. And, and as I sit, I mean, obviously we're not at the falls, but it stirred, boy, does it stir the memories. And you know what it reminds me again? Yeah, every day we have to live as disciples. Every day we do the little things. Every day the mom's changing a diaper and, and, a, and the dad's busy doing that. We, we, we do our daily work. Church is doing the work of discipleship day by day. But Sid, when we have experienced the glory, when we've been under those falls, so to say, how can we live without it? How can we just go back to normal church life? Those of us who've tasted and seen, and those who've just heard about it. They read about Brownsville, like I read about the Welsh Revival. I want to shout to everyone, it's real. It's the nature of God. It's the reality of God. And what he wants to do is the thing that's been abnormal, that's been exceptional. He wants that to be the norm. He wants that to be the climactic thing before he returns. Why not now? 
Why not here? Why not something greater than we've ever seen? Does God not have the ability? He does. Does God not have the desire? He does. How about us hungering and thirsting until the answer comes? You said something. Why not now? Why not here? Would you pray for us? So it is now. Yes. It is here. Yes. Father, right now, I pray for every single one watching. May there be a hunger, a thirst, a desire, a passion, the likes of which they've never known. May they have a cry that comes from the depth of their being. God, visit me now. God, send the fire now. God, change me now. God, send your glory now for your honor, for the sake of a dying world, for the exaltation of the name of Jesus, for the salvation of the Jewish people here and now. Start with me. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You live a holy life. God says, be ye holy, for I am holy. Instant, instant, instant repentance. Got it?